eight o'clock. So I think we will um, we will begin. Um, so for everyone that's joined, thank you. I'm Danny Stone. I'm the chief executive of the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust and delighted to be co-hosting this event with Chabad Northeast London and Essex. We'll hear from Rabbi Suffering towards the end, as I've just said. Um, a special note of thanks to Hazel Weinberg and Laurel Nygate uh, for making this event happen. Uh, the topic is anti-Semitism here and now. We're in the shadow of Holocaust Memorial Day. Incidents have been increasing, uh, but we have a vibrant and diverse Jewish community. So should we be worried? Um, what is there to do? What can we do? What has been done? All questions that we'll be um, putting to our panel. Uh, now, this is my first time chairing a Zoom event, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, not often you get to do new things in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm delighted to tell you it's the best panel that you will see um, on Zoom. Uh, we have a series of distinguished and very well-informed guests. Uh, so I will race through their bio some potted biographies. Um, starting with Lord Mann, uh, John Mann, Lord Mann of Holbeck Moore, is a British uh, independent politician, serves a, as an advisor to the government on anti-Semitism, uh, sitting as a member of the House of Lords. Prior to be granted a pe peerage, he was the Labour Party excuse me, the Labour Party Member of Parliament for Bassett Law from 2001 until 2019. John served on the Treasury Committee as an MP, including as Vice Chair and was a Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Minister for Sport. He's been a vocal anti-racist since his student days, was Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group Against Anti-Semitism, and I think is the President now, received the American Jewish Committee's Jan Karski Award for his commitment to addressing anti-Semitism and chaired the FA Task Force on Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Uh, and has a reputation for telling it how it is. Andrew Percy uh, hails from and is the Conservative MP for Brigham Gould. Prior to his election to Parliament, Andrew was a school teacher educating secondary school pupils in history in some of the toughest schools in Hull. He has worked locally as a school governor, a local councillor, most recently in the ambulance service, uh, former minister for the Department of Communities and Local Government, former prime ministerial trade envoy to Canada, served on the Health and Northern Ireland Select Committees, currently the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group against anti-Semitism, and today was holding Amazon, uh, taking Amazon to task for its failures to tackle anti-Jewish racism. Um, he might not be a teacher any longer, but it takes no truck when it comes to anti-Semitism. Rosie Duffield is from London, lived and worked in Canterbury for 20 years, including as a teaching assistant in local schools with charities, churches and parents groups. In 2016, she was chosen as one of the first Labour women for the Joe Cox Women in Leadership Scheme, and in 2017 became the first Labour MP for the seat of Canterbury since its creation nearly 100 years prior. She was a parliamentary private secretary to the Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities, a Labour whip, has sat on the Women and Equalities and Work and Pension Select Committees, and has been chair of the Women's Parliamentary Labour Party. Uh, and just today, she and Andrew were making very strong speeches uh, about Holocaust remembrance and against anti-Semitism. Um, Rosie uh, is a champion, a parliamentary champion, and I'm so delighted to have you here, Rosie. Thank you. Um, Fiaz Magal. Fiaz. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, was born in Uganda, moving to the UK as a baby and then to Nairobi, fleeing violence and persecution back to the UK in Kent. He had 20 years working in the voluntary and community sector and 12 years in politics. Uh, I think at one, at one point was fine to be, be mayor of London, if, I, if I'm right. Uh, certainly, certainly was in the running. Um, he founded Faith Matters, Tell Mama, which for those of you that know the Community Security Trust records anti-Muslim attacks um, and the Muslims against anti semitism and was an awarded an OBE for his work. Uh, now, two more brief things from me. One is housekeeping. So please do put the questions that you have into the Q&A function. I'll seek to go around the panelists and uh, invite them to, to make contributions. We will have, um, as I say, uh, a closing remarks from Rabbi Suffren. Uh, so with that, we will begin. Um, I was interested to hear from each of the panelists, um, given you all work or have been involved in addressing anti-Semitism, can you talk about perhaps your personal experience of anti-Semitism or, or contact with it through through work? Have you had any any experiences that might be of interest to the people uh, listening in? Um, and I guess we'll start with we'll start with Lord Mann. We'll start with the the upper house. John, you're on mute. Uh, thanks, uh, Danny. Only only as a proxy, but as a proxy. Um, Perhaps some people think I am Jewish. Uh, the uh, I get um, 
I, I have had, my family's had, my staff have had um, serious level anti-Semitism. We've had it in bulk and we've had it with violence attached and we've had three people imprisoned because of it. Three people imprisoned. I repeat that because that, if you think about it, it's quite astonishing um, uh, in the context of the, the country we live in. And I've been in the Labour Party, still am, for over 40 years. In the context of being the Labour Party for over 40 years, that's astonishing that that's all happened in recent years. And what's interesting and significant, I've had it from the, the far left within the Labour Party. I've had it from Islamists. I've had it from the far right. So all three of the identifiable forms of anti-Semitism and equally threatening, equally dangerous. And uh, frankly, that's nothing compared to what I've seen some Jewish politicians get. And uh, with three people in prison, that's, that's quite saying something. Thanks, John. Um, Andrew, as co-chair of the APPG, have you, have you experienced uh, anti-Semitism? Yes, um, sadly. Um, I, I think the first time I uh, experienced this was um, in 2014, when I was actually in Israel, when uh, the uh, Israel-Gaza war conflict was taking place, Operation, I think that was Protective Edge. Uh, and obviously the rockets were coming over and uh, I, I was there on a Conservative Friends of Israel trip that had stayed on for a personal vacation and uh, obviously witnessed what was happening and, you know, spent some time in bomb shelters. So for some reason it got out that I was there and Channel 4 then were desperately trying to chase us down. Uh, I refused to do anything about it, but I was still on something called Twitter then, which I advise everybody to leave immediately. Um, and I became suddenly, just because of the fact I was out there, suddenly get, getting subjected to all this quite unpleasant anti-Semitic abuse um, uh, 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 for simply being in Israel and being a supporter of Israel, coming from all uh, the usual types, but, uh, you know, uh, it was really quite unpleasant. I suppose I'd really, uh, you know, people making comments about me and my physical appearance have been, um, of looking Jewish, which I thought was a bit weird, because um, I may know my story. I converted to Judaism, but I, you know, I always say I converted to Judaism to uh, 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 legitimise the anti-Semitism I was suffering uh, beforehand, because uh, it was quite weird, you know, coming to me in that in that form. I just thought this was very bizarre. It was all about I was in Israel, as far as I was concerned. The fact I was in Israel didn't mean you should be subjected to personal anti-Semitic abuse. But then I had a number of incidents in the well, 2017 election. Um, by some of these quite hard left activists who suddenly started taking against uh, me because of the work I'd done calling out um, anti-Semitism or in CFI, uh, was physically assaulted in the street by one of them, who we never found, but then quite by accident, as I was getting off the train at Doncaster a year or so later, the same people uh, physically confronted me and basically brought the shopping centre to a standstill. Uh, so I videoed them this time, we had them arrested, and they were the trial was due to begin, um, but sadly it had, it collapsed because of a procedural error by one of the police forces here. But that was you know being screamed at that I was Israeli scum, um, uh, and that you know told to f off and eat my Jew food. And these were people who were you know political activists. Um, so you know it, it you know which is nothing as as, as uh, John has said compared to some of what some of our colleagues have faced, particularly on the labour benches. So yes, the, those are my experiences, and you know, was, was quite shocked by them. But all it's done is, you know, no one's going to intimidate me. All it's done is made me more determined to do something about this. So, you know, but, but I'm, I'm looking that I'm, you know, it doesn't get to me in the same way perhaps now because if you, you get thick skin in this game. But you know, for some, you know, it, it's just, you know, it, it is pretty unpleasant. There's no doubt about it. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, um, for sharing that. that personal experience. Rosie, I mean, I know that you also, have, have, you know, like Andrew, suffered abuse online. Have you have you been targeted with kind of anti-Semitic abuse or anti-Semitic abuse by proxy? Yeah, I mean, I'm not Jewish. I was raised a Catholic. Um, some of my earliest memories are my granddad telling me about why the war was so important. So I always knew about fascism. I always knew about the concentration camps. I knew why people like my granddad was so desperate to fight 
in the war and and sort of make sure that we weren't taken over by this regime and you know it was just a no-brainer when I when I found more and more anti-semitism within the ranks of my own party you know it became it came to a point where you think I'm not imagining this this is really happening it's happening on a large scale and you know just sitting with some of those women who were forced out of our party in the last few years as they read out some of the disgusting comments John John would have been there at the um, weekly parliamentary Labour Party meetings when some of them just read out the abuse some were in tears others were in tears listening to them it was beyond disgusting it was real and it was happening and I was abused for calling it out and still out sometimes and um you know it, it's some of the things you get called you wouldn't even want your mum to read you know absolutely disgusting stuff I know it's not just the Labour Party but we legitimized it we said it was okay somehow those people felt that they were able to join the party and particularly to support the last leader and they they almost found it an attractive place because of that and it was awful and I'm really glad that things seem to be getting better too slowly but they're still getting better so mm. thank thank you Rosie I mean these are all I think subjects we'll touch on on all of these as we go through you know online harm to anti-semitism in the Labour Party um Fiaz, have you have you experienced anti-semitism uh have you have you seen it coming in against you maybe or in 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 some kind, kind of emails or have you experienced it or perhaps you could talk about the, your experiences of, of anti-muslim hatred too Sure. Um, I'll give you both elements, actually, both both examples. Um, you know, the anti-Semitism I mean, start with that, that I've received has basically been from, um, I would say, Islamist extremist groups and also soft Islamist groups who have a political view around Israel. And anyone who dares to talk about um, support for the state to exist, um, anyone who talks about stronger Jewish-Muslim relations and building stronger connections, anyone who talks about Jewish rights of um, and making their own decisions and being safe and secure um, and who's been in the public sphere has been targeted over the last 10, 20 years by these Islamist extremist groups. So the first thing is, yes, I've received lots of um, material saying that I'm a, you know, I'm a secret Mossad Zionist agent, I'm a secret Jew lover, I should move to Israel, I should leave my religion and I'm no longer Muslim and actually threats according to that uh, to those lines um, that's the first thing the second thing is um, I've also received on the flip side of that as I as I kind of look into this uh, sustained campaigns you know sustained campaigns uh, against myself and others but but uh, campaigns in mosques saying don't engage with their organizations leaflet campaigns um, campaigns saying that we are funded by Israel um, campaign saying we are funded by Mossad and the intelligence agency, by the CIA. This nonsense is akin to the Trumpesque style of QAnon nonsense that we see in the United States. So it's quite bizarre, but yet it's quite twisted that Islamist groups are promoting the same narratives as far right groups and QAnon groups in the United States. So there is some relevance in both of these twisted narratives in the in the way that they actually correlate. Um, so the anti-Semitism comes through that angle in terms of saying you're an ally of um, Jewish community, you're an ally to see the state of Israel exist, so you must be secretly part of the cabal. That's, that's the anti-Semitic narr narrative. Um, the anti-Muslim rhetoric I received was quite sub sustained and quite substantive um, since I started Tell My Moan in 2012. Um, I have to say on the back of a Telegraph article that was complete pack of nonsense. Um, it set me up for years of abuse um, and uh, it set me up for years of abuse from uh, far right individuals, one of whom I managed to find and give the evidence to the police because the police didn't give a damn. They basically said what well, anti-Muslim uh, re rhetoric and anti-Muslim hatred because in those days it really wasn't part of the kind of social agenda of discussion. So um, an individual who'd email me every day and abuse me and be racist as well as anti-Muslim to me I had to find his details by um, basically paying a company in Miami to track him online. And we tracked him, we found who he was, we found who his wife was, who his kids were, and we frankly turned the tables on him as he was trying to do with me. And I presented that to the CPS. Now, the sad thing about that is that a jury, when it went to trial, let him off. And the jury said, and the judge said, and I remember this rightly, and I think this is important because 
you know this is about this is about the process this is about statutory processes as, as well with minority groups the judge said it was free speech when i'm told that i'm a muslim and i don't belong in this country that i'm a rat and vermin i'm bacteria which is very similar to the rhetoric used against jewish community that is not free speech right so i didn't need a lecture from 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 a judge but the reality is it, the guy did it again he ended up in court this time we got him prosecuted but it had to build up an evidence an evidence base that the CPS learned from. And what I'm trying to say is the work of the CST, the work of yourselves, the work of organizations on anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hatred is key to ensuring wider society understands the impact on communities. So when it comes to things like sentencing, when it comes to things like prosecution, when it comes to things like going to court and getting a jury to understand, these are important factors, otherwise people get off in the system. Thank you, Fiers, and thank you for setting out how how you know the, how important it is that the frameworks operate in the ways that that they should. And um, again, touching on you know online harms, conspiracy theories. So uh, I I suppose that's a good area to move into. We've had a question about actually eBay um, selling Nazi era postcards. Um, and these still being on sale, um, the algorithm meaning eBay is regularly sending these graphic images to the individual via email, um, although they're a direct breach of their safeguards. Is it a lost cause when it comes to the internet? What can we do? Um, what should we be doing? Is there something that the people that are, that are watching could be doing? Um, I don't know if, uh, Andrew, you were talking about Amazon today. Do you, do you want to address that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't pretend there's a, a, an easy answer to this because, you know, you disappear off one platform, it reappears on a different platform. Uh, and, you know, we, we rely at the moment on goodwill of platforms based largely in Western countries where we're able to shame them, be it Facebook, be it Twitter. But look how long it took to shame Facebook uh, and uh, our ongoing issues at the moment with Amazon, uh, which I spoke to in the chamber today with regards to them um, uh, hosting um, stuff from David Icke. Uh, um, you know, so it, it is difficult. I mean, we have you know, there's things we can do legislatively, and obviously we're looking here at the online harms bill. I think the only way that lots of these operators will will appreciate their um, responsibilities is if we make them, you know, the, the, make the people at the top of these uh, companies um, personally liable for some of this. I think that's uh, uh, you know the way we have to start going. Significant fines alone don't seem to be enough. Um, we saw from a, we've talked a lot, haven't we, Danny, about the, the model in Germany, where you know if you're Facebook and the billions of Facebook, and you get a uh, you know a few million quid fine from uh, the German government, it makes very little difference to how you uh, operate. Um, so we've got to get tougher. I mean, the challenge is what do you do then if it moves onto platforms which are um, you know hosted elsewhere, where it's it's more difficult, it's you know the, the dark web and all the rest of it. But I don't think we should because it's difficult. Say we give up the battle because. You know, the fact is, the more we can name and shame, the more noise we can make on this, be it, you know, Islamophobic content, anti-Semitic content, far-right content, uh, whatever it is, um, uh, then the better. But, you know, I, I, think the more, I think we would all agree that the, the legislative framework in which these um, social media platforms operate is not sufficient. Uh, so we've got to get tougher. But I don't pretend there's an easy solution where you can just you know, click your fingers, implement a bit of law and everything will be fine because it won't. That's great. I think I think that's right, and it's got to be right. Um, uh, Fiaz, you you were in. I remember sitting in meetings in Europe with you um, with the with the social media companies. Um, what should they What should they be doing? What should we be pressing them to do? Is there a duty on them? There is absolutely a duty on them. Um, the speed in which they react to taking down um, illegal content is something we. I know the Euro European Union have got um, a framework in place with social media companies, but we need to hold them to account to that. They need to get stuff down in an hour, right? If it's terrorist material or it's, um, it's illegal material, we need to hold them to account for that. And we still get haphazard ways that they are removing material, keeping material uh, online. Um, clarity and transparency on their policy making process and how they come to decisions is fundamental. Look, I have a you know, I have a real problem with Donald Trump, right? And I'm glad he's out of office. I'm just going to be frank. But you have to ask yourself the question here, that if the if social media companies have the power to switch off elected members, right? If they have the power to switch off an elected member, what does that say about how powerful these platforms have become, 
Okay, so, you know, I'm taking a completely nonpartisan approach that if you can switch off the president of the United States in an instant, and you didn't switch him off for other for four years uh, of the time, we are in a serious problem where they've become more powerful than collective nations put together. I think, I think transparency, I think looking at their policy making processes, I think, for example, the subsidiary committees they've set up, Facebook has set up this subsidiary committee of people who look at how they deal with complaints. Well, actually, that seems pretty peripheral in terms of holding them to account. We want some central uh, decision-making processes which are held to account. And I think that's a long process, as has been just suggested, but I think the pressure needs to be on. Look, we've made headway. I'll just finish off with saying we've made enormous headway. I remember, Danny, you and I sitting in 2012, 2013, where they had no processes for removal. It was the Wild West. And we're now in a position where there are processes for removal. We have policies in place, but we still have inaction and we still have a lack of momentum from them to move in a direction which is ensuring the safety of individuals. That's what we're talking about here. I suppose as a chair, I should be neutral, but I'm, I'm finding myself agreeing with everyone that's spoken so far. Um, Rosie, you're, you're um, going to be on the Labour benches for the online safety bill. Um, do you think that there are particular things these companies should be doing? Have you already engaged with them, maybe? Um, I haven't personally, but I mean, I agree with everything Fiaz was saying. It's really interesting, isn't it, that Donald Trump was allowed to kind of spout his absolute weird kind of beliefs for years and years, then suddenly he disappeared. And I found that really sinister. Who actually is deciding that really weird, difficult sort of biting point between free speech and hate speech? And in a way, although I can never imagine myself agreeing with anything he said, I find it quite weird that suddenly he disappeared. Where's he gone to? We can't hold him to account. We can't see exactly what he's saying. And although he shouldn't be inciting people to riot, you know, we've got him doing that. And then we've got Etsy selling those t-shirts, which said Camp Auschwitz, which is utterly disgusting. And they only took them down when there was a great big outcry. I'm not gonna use that site ever again because they needed it to be telling to them you know to take it down they thought it was okay just to, to sort of glorify some weird kind of um t-shirt with hash fits on i mean how disgusting so yeah there is a really weird idea of what we can do i don't know exactly i'm hoping that you'll guide me through the online harms bill and i know that the cst i've, I've seen how they work and their work is incredible you know they're all over this and the things they have to read are just pretty horrific but they seem that you know I feel safe knowing they're around actually because I know that they will check up on all of us and that that's a real a real help yeah no well you're right um I equally would pay tribute to the work of the CSC I mean John you you've been there since the beginning you brought some of these companies together um to meet for the first time um so perhaps you can you can say a bit about what you think they should do and also um somebody also asked about this balance of free speech and protection from harms which which Rosie touched on so perhaps you can also touch on that too sorry John you're on mute again that question's an easy one. Um, I mean, we've got laws that define um, criminality in terms of speech. So I don't think we need to change the law in terms of free speech. Um, you know, in this country, uh, there is free speech. We are a democracy, we're an open society. Um, uh, but you're not free to uh, race, r racially uh, abuse people. Um, and we've got more sophisticated um, and that's good news. But I don't think we need more laws to do that. We need more consistent application of the laws we have. The big problem with the internet is the stuff that is not going to reach the criminal threshold, which is 99.99% of it, but is still a problem and often a big problem. Anybody who um, reads the Jewish Chronicle will be avidly reading uh, the current issue tomorrow morning does it come out um, or is it out already perhaps uh, the front page is good reading and I think there's stuff in the Jewish news and the Jewish Telegraph as well so I've just um, released a report into extremist websites looking at uh, oh the Canary and uh, Squawk Box and some far right uh, websites and what we find is an incredible reservoir of the conspiracy theories and the forms of hatred 
deep within them, for example, in what people post to them um, on their messaging boards where they have them. And we don't have any way of regulating them. So the answer to your question, what is needed, parliamentarians need to find an effective way of regulating in a way whereby the individual citizen or their community group of whatever kind has the power to uh, undo the damage done by things that are published. That's the key principle. And if we're clever about the legislation, we'll be able to do so in a way which I think would significantly improve the situation and empower the citizen. And I think in a democracy, citizens should be empowered. And I think when it comes to the internet, none of us are. And so we do need to um, rebalance, but it's up to legislators to sort that out. And we've got the chance in this country. Thank you, John. Um, I think you're right, and, and I'll look forward to working with everyone on the call um, on the online safety bill. Um, somebody's joined us from California and asked whether Donald Trump specifically, since his departure, whether that will um, impact anti-Semitism. But I'd like to join that with a question that was sent in in advance of the event, which is that, are there concerns here in the UK in respect of white supremacism possibly increasing copycat behaviour, especially in light of the US Capitol fiasco we saw unfold on our screen um, in January, during which we saw Nazi imagery, which has already been referenced tonight, and references amongst the rioters. So, you know, if anybody would like to take on that, the, the US dynamic and, and white supremacism, anyone uh, feel comfortable doing that? Andrew? We'll go for Andrew and then John. Andrew? Um, I'm happy to defer to John, uh, if, if his hand was up before mine, but um, Look, I think you know, we, we know that one of the biggest threats to the, um, from a terrorist point of view uh, at the moment is this rise of radical right wing um, extremism. And that is a major, major concern. I think the, the, the two things I'd, I think I'd separate out, you know, that fringe element, which is very dangerous and growing and doing particularly well among obviously young white men uh, uh, in certain communities. We really issue there. I think what I think when we bring Donald Trump into it, in terms of mainstream politics in the UK, um, I think there are uh, uh, I think there are some positives actually for where um, mainstream politicians are heading, and also where the public is heading on a number of the issues which can often feed into that um, uh, into this far right activity, particularly around white nationalism. And you know those figures would be the polling you see in the UK about how, what people register as their main political concerns, and we've seen that immigration has actually significantly reduced as a concern amongst the electorate in the last um, few years. Um, I think that is to be welcomed. Uh, I think the debate around immigration in the UK is perhaps a little less toxic than it was even a few years ago. Um, uh, uh, the fact that we, you know, the public seem more concerned about the delivery of public services, about, you know, things that affect their lives, their pocket, rather than immigration is, is to be welcomed. So hopefully that means that the, the ability of a far right group uh, we should turn to the political fray or a party to do well in the UK uh, uh, seems to be having its its route closed off somewhat. Um, but that is happening at the same time. And, you know, and if you look at all the polling, the UK remains this you know one of the most tolerant countries in Europe. Generally, a positive view of immigration and of immigrants and that what they contribute to the country. That's all for the positive. I think that's heading in the right direction at the moment. But we've got that happening at the same time. We do certainly have this rise in extreme right wing. Um, uh, um, 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 you know, activity, which is obviously very concerning to us. But that, I think, you know, so we're going to look away from the electoral side of it. I don't think we'll see a Trump type, um, uh, you know, electoral success here, but we absolutely have this growing problem when it comes to the most extreme elements. So something to be nervous about and something to be positive about. John? Uh, yeah, the, the, anyone who tries to draw comparisons between the situation in the US and the UK, it frankly doesn't know what they're talking about because the, uh, the nature of the cross-party work on anti-Semitism between the Labour and Conservative Party and other parties as well, all other parties, um, that I've been involved in for 15 years is so deep and profound. You, you simply can't get anything like that in the United States. So the political culture here is very different. 
But the, you know, there was an incident uh, this weekend. And near one of my, not literal neighbours, but a couple of miles away, uh, former constituent of mine, who came out with some uh, some pathetic racism, uh, crude, uh, nasty racism attacking Pretty Patel and anyone who's black or Asian um, in in horrific ways. The response of the local community was totally condemnatory. His local voluntary football club sacked him immediately. Uh, the local uh, uh, car dealers where he used to work put a statement up saying he'd never be employed by them again. Um, people shunned him um, and were incredibly hostile um, that someone from our area was saying anything like that. Um, and so, you know, we, ha- I mean, I've been targeted by national action. You know, my friend Rosie Cooper, they attempted to murder. Um, so national action are a threat and a problem, but they're absolutely a small minority group and other groups like them, the EGL and others, they're on the margins of the political world, on the margins of society. And occasionally an issue they run with gets, uh, you know, wider provenance, um, but it's more that they've picked on an issue that's already there than they've instigated it. Whereas in the US, we've had a whole series of terrorist murders from the far right, horrendous atrocities, tagging the Jewish community, tagging every community actually, and tagging no community. You know, at random, uh, Oklahoma, for example, with over 100 people murdered. And uh, so the, the situation in the US and the whole issue with guns and these groups having large numbers of guns is far more frightening, far more dangerous than anything we have um, in the in the UK. And I also think that the the white supremacist groups on the far right in parts of continental Europe are a bigger danger than we have in this country. So I'm not trying to underplay the issue in terms of the UK, but we also need to, we always need to be honest about the situation. We have nothing like the problems that they have in Germany that they have in Austria and that they have in Poland and not even vaguely anything like the problems they have in the US. And I think we've got good systems in governance and in civil society. The Community Security Trust has been a prime example of dealing with that. And I think we've got pretty much a consensus amongst politicians um, at the national level um, in, in that. And so I'm, I'm quite bullish that we can deal with white supremacists in this country. Thank you, John. That, that's the second kind of encouraging comment, I would say. Um, somebody's, a couple of people have written in about universities. Uh, oh, sorry, I should have just asked if Rosie or Fiaz particularly wanted to come in on, on that last last one. Um, but if not, then we'll, we'll move I just on. Want, I would just agree with, with both Andrew and John that actually we, we see these kind of undercover cover documentaries, don't we, about uh, Tommy Robinson and his like and, you know, what's really going on. And we can get really frightened watching those. But I think on the whole, Britain does reject those kind of far um, reaches of politics. And we do we are more sort of sensible and central generally, I think, in our beliefs. And it is easy to get really bogged down in this and to think it's everywhere. But... I don't think it is, and I don't think it is on the rise. I think we've kind of tipped the balance slightly. And America is more frightening because, yeah, as John said, they have access to all these weapons. At least we don't have that. And I think the key really is to understand the root causes of people being on on the extreme side. You know, we've seen, you know, headlines about people you know, the Islamophobic um, thing versus people going over to, to fight with ISIS. So, you know, there's got to be a root cause about feeling left behind and left out and disenfranchised that that's what we really have to tackle, isn't it? Quite right. Well, I, as I was just saying, we've had some questions in about universities. Um, some people saying universities are a hotbed of anti-Semitism. Uh, somebody saying it's only a small proportion of the number of universities that have adopted the, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, John, I'm going to come first to you because I know you've been working on this. Um, what What's happening on campus in reality? Oh, well, I, I'm not sure where people have got the, the idea it's a small proportion. Um, uh, I'm speaking with... Uh, Universities every day. I spoke with two vice chancellors today. Um, 
Uh, one of those universities has adopted IRA. Um, they're not on anyone's list. Hull, the University of Hull, I've put it out there today. The second one will be. Um, I'm not finding any um, resistance. I'm finding questions. I can answer those questions. And so I'm methodically going around every vice chancellor till I've spoken to them all. And I'm confident that uh, uh, they will all be using the IRA definition. And uh, once they understand what it is, what it isn't, how to use it, I'm finding that there's any misconceptions melt away. And we will be the leaders in the world in that. We will be the leaders in the world. First government to adopt IRA, first political parties, every political party in Westminster, virtually every MP, uh, we, you know, the entirety of English football, Premier League, English Football League, the FA, uh, uh, a new club today here, Brentford, four new German clubs, big, big clubs, Bayern Munich, for example, um, in the last 24 hours, four German multinationals, huge ones, have adopted it yesterday. Uh, we're on quite a move on this, and uh, it's um, it's also inaccurate to say that British universities are a hotbed of anti-Semitism. That's an, an inaccurate statement. Um, we undersell ourselves and what we do and the success of it. I'm not talking about me and Andrew and uh, uh, Rosie and Fires. I'm talking about the CST um, and, and, and the Jewish communal organisations, successive governments, university leaderships. But actually, the levels of anti-Semitism in British universities are very small. The key is to eradicate it. It's much more possible to eradicate it in a university than anywhere else in society. Universities are meant to be uh, the most tolerant part of uh, our, our country. And so giving stu Jewish students the tools to deal with any issues, giving universities the tools to intervene to stop any issues is key to it. And then if people choose to be anti-Semitic, it's much easier to deal with them. They're doing so deliberately, calculatedly, and uh, they can be deal with, dealt with severely. And but I, uh, in my five years, all I intend to do is ensure ma ma the, the maximum of any success I have will be, does a 16-year-old Jewish teenager in this country have the freedom to be themselves in any way they want without restriction? That's the only barometer of success. Um, that's a pretty high barometer of uh, uh, threshold for success, but that's my objective. And I think the universities, um, uh, I don't think they're a huge problem, but they are a problem. And I think we're getting on top of that. And IRA is going to help significantly in, uh, in, in minimise even further anti-Semitism on campus. Thank you, John. Anyone else want to talk on universities in particular? Uh, Fiaz, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add uh, on what Lord Mann had said that, you know, when I had the opportunity to speak to students and some of the projects that we were doing on campus, and it was important to speak to Jewish and Muslim students in some of the projects I did, I was just struck by the level of fear. Actually, I remember, I remember the level of fear within Jewish students going around 2014, 2017, 18, when these projects were taking, were taking place. And what was, what was really um, an eye opener to me was you know, in a seat of learning and a seat where people are absorbing information and, and material, uh, Jewish students just did not feel comfortable in that environment. Now, perception, reality, whatever the, re whatever the case, there, there must be something that is going through the community that makes them feel that unease. And it is a sad indictment of the kind of state of affairs if that is how a section of our young people felt in university. So um, I just wanted to add that because it was striking how many Jewish students felt a, a sense of insecurity and unease on campus that I'd spoken to. Thanks, Fiaz. Um, just to add, sorry, to that, Andrew. I, think, I think that's a really, I think both um, comments are really important because I think, you know, John's right that it's not a hotbed in the sense that you know, most students who are attending universities don't hold an anti-Semitic bone in their body and are not engaging in anti-Semitic behavior. The problem we have, as Fiaz has uh, identified, is that there are a minority 
are very vocal, very loud. Sadly, some of them, and some of the issues, particularly when they uh, wrap it all up with Israel, are supported by some academics themselves, um, who then create this feeling of it being a hotbed of anti-Semitism. You know, so one anti-Semite uh, on campus is enough to make every Jewish student feel uncomfortable. But you know, I, I would say it's the same as anti-Semitism in this country. You know, overwhelmingly, the people in this country do not hold anti-Semitic views. Um, you know, and that's the same on campus. Most students go about their business on campus without a second thought about whether their student next to them is Jewish or not. Um, but it's this radical minority who are making people feel unsafe, and we've got to do more about it. And that's why the work John is doing is uh, so important. Well, it's interesting because you know you talk about about the the kind of the minimalist kind of um, not minimalist the, you know the small amount potentially of anti semites there are in the UK and, and the data backs that up. But we've had a question about a, a kind of I might say fatalistic question. Anti semitism is kind of it crosses classes, political affiliations, religions, um, and we even find it in anti racist groups and um, the you know references here to Black Lives Matter organization to um, to the Labour Party, the Women's March. Um, Rosie, I suppose, you know, as, as a Labour MP, this may feel unfair as, as you're the only Labour MP on the panel, but do you want to reflect on some of that? Um, what can we do about it? You know, you, you referenced earlier Labour being in a good place. Could it do more? What would you like to see happen? And, and is there something that works in terms of dealing with either anti-racist groups, groups that are that, that purport to be anti-racist, in trying to ensure that they understand what anti-Semitism is? Have you seen anything that works? Yeah, I mean, we, we're so lucky in the Labour Party to have the Jewish Labour movement who are as old as the party itself. So they've been doing sort of training for years and years. Um, but the problem has been in the last few years that um, certain, you know, certain Labour clubs, we call them the CLPs, the constituency Labour parties in, in each area, we all have our own ones. Some of them reject the Jewish Labour movement and won't invite them or allow them to come along and do the training. Uh, mine has been one of those. So um, building those bridges again getting groups like JLM in to, to just speak honestly and the key thing surely in any sort of dealing with any racism is just to listen to the groups who are you know in that race themselves and have experienced it themselves rather than a group of other people who are not in that group saying well no you don't you, that's not really true that's not really real and I found that I was fighting that in my own CLP kind of week after week them telling me that I was imagining it that it wasn't true that it wasn't a problem in the Labour Party almost sort of screaming it in my face and I, you know I'd have, have sat next to Louise Elman the day before reading some of the stuff that she got so it, it's it's crossing over that and making people realize that you know John Mann isn't talking rubbish because he didn't like Jeremy Corbyn on a personal level he's experienced those things you know and the ease in which people say we're making it up or that Jewish people are making it up and that's why non Jews are so important in my opinion in this fight we've got to say you are believed we're there believing you and supporting you all you've got to do is tell us and we should be there you know dealing with it for you Ruth Smith got to the stage where she was standing up and saying and and uh, Margaret Hodge mentioned this morning she when she was elected she happened to be uh, a woman MP who was Jewish and then she became the Jewish MP you know it's our job the rest of us to sort of take that flat for our friends neighbours and colleagues wherever they um, experience it if they tell us we should be dealing with it because it doesn't affect us in the same way as it does them so I think it's about just listening to people believing them and if they tell us we're not getting it right let's change that and I mean Andrew you that, that, thank you Rosie and Andrew you you obviously chair the co-chair the APPG on anti-semitism the all-party group uh th this point about it being in all in all parties you've spoken out about um conservative MPs using language in particular ways you got some reflections on that yeah, I mean, I, I think, first of all, just to say thank you to Rosie, because I think, you know, um, over the last two, three years, it's been quite difficult. Well, it's been very difficult for a lot of, uh, um, you know, our colleagues on the Labour benches who've done the decent thing, wanted to do the decent thing, and then, then been attacked and punished by people who are supposed to be on their side. So I think they've been very brave and, you know, we sh the whole Jewish community um, should be grateful to and thankful to MPs like Rosie. Um, uh, I mean, you know, it's been a, it, it's a, you know, it's a different scale on what's happened on our side. I think the, you know, what we've, uh, and that doesn't mean we don't have problems and we've had problems with members uh, and sometimes we've reacted slowly to that. Sometimes we reacted well to it, but we've had problems also with colleagues who have found themselves engaging in uh, anti-Semitic 
and Islamophobic um, uh, content online, which I give them the benefit of the doubt and believe that for most of them, if not all of them that we have worked with Danny, it's been um, stuff they've fallen into accidentally. But I think there is a there is a point though where where if people keep falling accidentally into um, into uh, anti Muslim, then then they perhaps have to look a little bit closer to themselves about whether or not they may indeed be the very thing they claim not to be. But the key thing is that in the, through the APPG is that we try and do this as cross party as, pro, as possible. It would be very easy for us as Tory MPs over the last few years to just stand up and condemn the Labour Party and try and make politics out of it. And there are colleagues on my side who have done a bit of that. I think there are some colleagues on the other side who have um, are done the same with in reverse on Islamophobia, for example, and that does none of us any good. Um, and that is the value, I think, of the APPG. Um, so, you know, we've called out colleagues for using, I've called out colleagues for using phrases such as cultural Marxism, which do have, um, you know, anti-Semitic uh, uh, overtones uh, and people who have found themselves in various Facebook groups and all the rest of it. Um, and it's important we continue to do that. Um, but I think it is better when we call it out on a cross-party basis. Um, not only because it means we're able to support each other better, but I think we it gives lends more credibility if we can take the politics out of it. Um, um, so, you know, that's what I'll continue doing. I think that's what the APPG will continue to do. Yeah, and, it, and it's worth saying it's to those saying. listening that, that it, um, it's a very, I, I consider it a brave thing to do because it doesn't necessarily make you any friends calling out your own side. Um, and so to all of those that do it, all of the people here, um, I salute you. Fiaz, you've worked in anti I'm, And I'm quite hard to like anyway, Danny, so it really doesn't <laughs> work for me. So <laughs> <laughs> I like you. You've got one friend on the call. Um, Fiaz, you, you've uh, worked in anti-racism spaces for a very long time. Um, you know, have you got any reflections on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, look, we've all realised the anti-Semitism within, within the far right and sometimes the right side of the political spectrum. We've seen that, we understand that, we know that, a lot of work has been done on that. But what has been particularly problematic with the left has been the fact that um, this altruism that we cannot be racist, we cannot be prejudicial, has been, a, has been a pervasive vein through the left. Now, I get that, I understand that. And in a majority of occasions, that, that has resonance and truth to it. But the reality is it has blurred the anti-Semitic anti racism in some sections of the left. And the, the, the problem has been, and, and here lies the seat of the problem, as part of the narrative against racism, it pretty much is, and I agree with it, it's, a, it's about standing up to power, and it's a get about standing up to power and prejudice. And within that vein, some on the political left have placed Israel as being all powerful, all encompassing, and in effect playing up to anti Semitic tropes. That's part of the anti Semitic trope. And so the left has seen Israel as being part of the kind of global, powerful US colonial hegemony. This is where this is coming from. And in doing so, anything around Jews, anything around Israel has been disregarded. And so anti Semitism, as part of that discussion, is being disregarded by some of the left as being, well, they're all powerful they don't need support from the from from the anti-racist alliances and actually they are part of the problem here is the here is the engine of what has been taking place within sections of the left left over the last five six seven years and it is a cancerous thing part of uh, and cancerous thought process so let me explain if that is the if that is the perception which is promulgated and promoted by some sections in the left and how do you explain my family being kicked out by africans in east africa Who's all powerful there? When we were refugees in 1971, when we were kicked out penniless, my family here, I'm at my mother's house. My mother arrived in this country with nothing in her pocket and made her life. We were kicked out by Africans. So what does the anti-racist alliance say about us, Ugandan Asians who were kicked out with nothing? Nothing, because it doesn't suit the narrative. Even though the all powerful in that situation was Idi Amin and the African, East African Ugandan regime at that moment in time. So I see this as part of a pervasive racism against Jews this narrative that actually Israel is all powerful, well, no, it's not. That it is all dominating, no, it's not. And actually Israel and the perception by some of the left is that it is white, no, it's not. Because if they wanted to put the powerful narrative into play, what about people like me who were kicked out by an African majority? Isn't that part of the racism we suffered? So it doesn't make sense. And I think we need to call out that section on the left which has this kind of twisted narrative that 
the 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 all encompassing white world is a is a problem. Yes, yes, majority of instances have taken place because of white colonialism, but actually it doesn't fit the narrative when you look at anti-Jewish racism. And actually, instead of stand, standing as allies with Jews, they have actually demonized the very community whom we should have been allies with in that process. So I just thought I wanted to make that clear because I think some in the left and the anti-racist movements need to have a long, hard look at themselves in how they look at power and prejudice. Well, wow, that's very powerfully put. There's, that's a lot to think about. Um, John, uh, have you got any reflections on, on, on this? No, other than to say that the Jewish community and those listening in need to realise the um, not just the bravery which is there of some of the people who've just spoken, or all the three people who've just spoken, and their integrity, um, but how things have really changed. And it's really easy to miss this because, you know, it was a horrendous time when Corbyn losing control of everything and being a beacon for anti-Semites, uh, joining the Labour Party and, you know, emerging from under the floorboards everywhere to do so. Um, but we stood up. And we beat it back and we won. And, you know, you, 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 you're looking here um, at Fayez, who's been doing it for a long time. He doesn't have to do it. He's chosen to do it. And has paid a price by doing so, but continues to. You've got Andrew. Andrew doesn't have to act in the way he has. It doesn't win him friends in the Conservative Party by being resolute that he will call out anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, the Liberal Party, the SNP and the Conservative Party. Yeah, you know, it doesn't win your friends. I think it wins your respect. But it doesn't win your friends. And it can be a pretty lonely place, Parliament. And Rosie, who you know, I call on people to do her little bit, she does her little bit and has three years of hell for doing what was right and continues to do it, doesn't do less, doesn't hide away, but stays consistent. And so her little bit actually has led to the most horrendous abuse that she's received, that she's far too modest to ever really talk about. But I know what goes on in her constituency Labour Party historically, and what she's had to put up with, and it's beyond normality. And, uh, you know, that gets to you. You know, it, 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 it wears you out. That's the problem with it. And yet, look, we're all still standing. We're winning. And at the general election, tell all your friends this, the story of the general election. So the general election, the political story, Boris Johnson wins the election. Predictably, Corbyn loses it, predictably. But the real story of the general election is in West Bromwich and Derby. George Galloway, very well known, stood in West Bromwich. George Galloway lost deposit less than 2%. Christopher Williamson stood in his own seat in Derby, where he'd been the council leader. The council leader, less than 2%, lost deposit. Rejected, humiliated by the British people. That should give everyone listening in tonight, real comfort. This country does not accept anti-Semitism. Those two results show vividly how they don't. We're significantly better organised. We're the ones on the offensive now. And some of us are spending good time seeking out and taking on the anti-Semites in their backyard and hurting them on it. And so, you know, I say to everyone, do your little bit. Everyone does their little bit, we win. So that's my call on you tonight. All do just a little bit. And if we all do a little bit in the right way, we win. Gosh, that's the, that's the kind of thing that you want to stand up and applaud if, we're, if I weren't only dressing the top up. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, 
Uh, I'm going to, because we're near time, there was one further question that I just wanted to put to uh, maybe one or two people on the call want to want to take it. Um, and then I'll, I'll have a final question before passing to Rabbi Suffren. So the, the question um, was about the, there was a, a wedding in the Stamford Hill area of London, um, which was reported on the BBC. Um, you may have seen um, amongst the ultra Orthodox community, uh, widely condemned, included by the chief rabbi. Um, but there was also an event at a police station that was in the press. And the, the questioner has asked, is there a kind of responsibility to the media to frame or filter these kind of things um, and they I, I think the questioner is concerned that perhaps this might have, have inspired some anti-semitism so I don't know if anyone wants to wants to pick that up shall I have a go then <laughs> go for it um, uh, I, I'm gonna be careful what I say here because I, I saw the BBC's reaction to um, the wedding story and the prominence it received including the invitation for people to have their say on it. And I'll be very careful with my words, but it, I, and I think the, and I, I would, it's not a criticism when I say this uh, of the BBC, because I think they're, 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 they'd be right to do this. Um, but if that had been other communities, I do wonder whether the prominence would have been given to the story that was given to the story, and then might, might well not have given the prominence to the story because they might've been worried about the reaction to it. And so therefore, I, I think, you know, in, in not potentially giving prominence, it would have been the right thing to do because it would have been aware of their responsibilities not to give a false impression about a particular community, whether they follow the rules or not. Um, so that question did go across my mind. I don't know whether I've resolved it properly in my head yet, um, but it seemed a, a bizarre thing given that, you know, um, just up the road from me here in Scarborough, the police have given out, you know, 92 fines in a weekend because of ongoing house parties every weekend along um, the sea from and that doesn't seem to have the prominence uh, that this one event uh, got now you know one has to be careful not to always look for conspiracy and you know to be offended in everything um but it, it was a, it was striking that this particular incident got a lot of coverage to the point where as i say I was inviting people to have your say so as i haven't resolved it in my head yet but what i would say is that however anybody breaking the rules uh, at this moment in time should be given prominence because we are in a very dangerous position as a country. Um, so I don't know whether I've answered the question, but I, I, all I've done is really said I have asked myself the same question. And, and did anyone else want to just add, a, add any words? Rosie, yeah. Um, I think that does raise the question actually, doesn't it? Why are most forms of racism rightly condemned? And we've, we've touched on the fact that Britain does mostly hate anti-Semitism, but it does seem to be much more accepted, doesn't it, than lots of other forms of racism, you know? And if we don't watch really carefully, you know, it can sort of creep in. And I found the same in my area about the Gypsy Roma community, um, that that's another sort of accepted form of racism. So we do have to be really careful that there is sort of balanced reporting on on all these things but yeah I haven't actually followed that story about the police station so I didn't know it hadn't got as much coverage so it's, it's worth watching out for. Great well look we, we are coming up on time so just before I pass to Rabbi Suffren I wonder whether either if panelists have any closing remarks but to, to frame that is there anything that, that you would consider your biggest success in dealing with anti-semitism to date or what do you hope for for the future e either either or um, we'll start with the uh, um well i think my biggest success in challenging anti-semitism I, I wouldn't i wouldn't call it a success let me just say it's an ongoing lifetime piece of work i think which is challenging islamist groups around their anti-Semitic rhetoric. I will continue to do so. I'll continue to be a thorn in their side. I'll continue to call them out because I think until that narrative is completely obliterated, we are going to have young minds infected by this view, um, you know, that just focuses on Israel and focuses on Jewish communities. So, so I think it's a work in progress, but challenging Islamist groups and Islamist extremism and Islamist um, anti-Semitism is something that I will continue to do to my dying day. Rosie. I don't know about my biggest success, but it was incredibly hard work in 2019 in December 
knocking on doors and persuading people that although my leader was seen as anti-Semitic, because it did come up on the doorsteps, you know, I don't have a job, I don't even have a synagogue in my constituency, but loads of people were so concerned about it and persuading them that I wasn't an anti-Semite, that I didn't support a leader who was seen as an anti-Semite and that I would work every day to, to change that from my party and I will always do that and I can see that we are getting a change because MPs just wouldn't be quiet about it and you know we were led by John who was incredibly brave at meetings where it was really hard actually to speak up and not to get too emotional and that has really changed things and I think that's a great success for the Labour Party I hope it carries on my hope is that we do carry on getting rid of anti-Semites and not being seen as a haven for them. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. I think it. Um, I, I, look, I think it's to John's point, really, um, in that I'm just really proud to have been a very small part of the battle over the last couple of years. To you know, uh, which has been raging on the left, but which you know, those of us on the centre right politics have tried to be allies in and allies in a non-partisan way. Um, I'm th those parliamentary moments we had when John was still at the. Uh, commoner end of the uh, of the of the building um, uh, when we were going into battle together Labour MP Conservative MP Lib Dual Democrats um, together in support of our colleagues who were you know being let down by a leadership of a party and I remember speaking once with um, Jeremy Corbyn on the front bench uh, and I particularly enjoyed that because of what I was able to say very directly but hearing you know, just being part of that battle and it all meaning something when in the 2019 general election, because after the 2017 election, I became very uh, depressed, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, thinking that how can somebody who is so unfit for office because of the people they've surrounded themselves with almost come into, how can this country almost vote them in? Uh, 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 and, but actually getting to 2019 and knocking on a door in the next door seat to me, Thunthorpe, and just in a really you know, tough neighborhood, um, you know, uh, and, a, and, a, and a, it was a woman came to the door, she said, oh, she said, I'm voting for your lot. And I said, oh, why is that? She went, because that, that Jeremy Corbyn doesn't like the Jews. And this woman, you know, just said to me, she said, what happened to them in the war must never be forgotten. And I just thought the fact that this had got through to somebody living on a council house in Scunthorpe, in a part of the country where, you know, we'd struggle to get a minion together of Jews. There was, you know, there's nobody here. Um, the fact that it got down and this working class, decent voter who voted Labour all their life just knew something didn't smell right about this man. And that finally, because it didn't get through in 17, I thought that was the decency of the British people, how we reject extremism. We won't vote racists in, you know, the, you know, but the BNP didn't last very long in this country, did they? Uh, with the electoral success. And I thought, and that to me meant everything because I just thought we've, you know, we, we've got there. The, the decency of the British people has come out and to have played just a small part in that in parliament uh, it's something I'll be very, very proud of forever. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and we'll go to John, finally. Well, our, our biggest success is, is ours, not mine. It's ours. Um, it's yours, Danny. Um, of course, I've been involved. It's Rose's. It's Fires's. It's, uh, it's Andrew's. We, 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 what we've managed to do is set a model for the rest of the world in getting our parliamentarians to work across party on anti-Semitism. And that was so strong that it even withheld, withstood the Corbyn era. That's what's really remarkable. So the all party group is as strong and buoyant as it ever was post the Corbyn era, but it maintained it all the way through. And you know, there's lots of things I think we've managed to achieve together. Um, but we've taught others around the world how that needs to be done. And uh, you know, the Germans have followed that model with huge success, huge success, working cross-party for the first time. Other countries are doing the same thing. Um, the, the, the Canadians, who today uh, have just given £2 million to... UNESCO to fund uh, anti-Semitic education work from the Canadian government. Um, that wouldn't have happened if they didn't have that cross-party consensus there. Uh, and they learned from us in doing that. And 
I'm so optimistic. I even think there's possibilities in the US. Um, I'm not saying that every politician there will engage, but then every politician in Britain doesn't engage. But I think the the really serious ones will, and that's our success. And uh, I just repeat to 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 to, to those who are listening, watching in um, tonight. Um, we're winning. We're winning. Do not forget that. We are winning. And as long as we continue to work together and be honest about the problems, never exaggerate, but never ignore them, we will win. But it does require all of you to do your little bit as well. And your little bit can be very, very small, but just do it well. It could be a letter to your local council if they haven't adopted IRA. It could be a letter uh, to your MP if they say something stupid, gently admonishing them and educating them. It could be a uh, could be a letter to your football club. They've all now adopted IRA, so how are they going to use it? Could be a letter to your local university to thank them or to encourage them to adopt IRA. You know, there are many ways it can be done. Don't underestimate your power in this. We all have that bit of power. And, you know, when you're on the national scene, you stand out more. But we're doing nothing different to what you're doing. So if we all do our little bit, we win. And that's what I hope you'll take from this. The other three on this panel, they're testimony to how you can do your little bit and a lot more and the impact it has. Decent people being normal. That's what Rosie Fires and Andrew are. Decent people being normal. And actually no more than that. But that's big. Because they've had the courage to do it well and consistently. So that's what everyone should do. And that's what you should be calling on everyone else to do. The more we have, the quicker we win and the bigger we win. But we are winning. Gosh, what a note to finish on. Um, John, I mean, I, it is the privilege of my life to work with the people on this panel. Um, I just, I, you can, you can quite quickly tell when people are decent, as John says, when they are uh, not just say they're anti-racist, but when they, when they mean it, when it's in their blood and everyone on this panel, not least because they've given up an hour of their time uh, to talk about anti-Semitism tonight, but in their life and in their actions, through their actions, um, have proven their commitments tackling anti-Jewish racism. So um, just.